What's up, Story Geeks? It's Jay. And Daryl. And on today's show, we're going to dig deeper into a quiet place. I'm so excited. Sci-fi geek horror. Oh my gosh, I love this movie so much. We're kicking off Scary Movie Month. That's right. Joining us today, we have a very special guest today. Markeia McCarty from Marvel Movie News is joining us. You have likely seen her many places across the geek internet. We're really excited to have her with us today. Absolutely, and we would love to hear your thoughts on A Quiet Place as well, which you can share with us in the Story Geeks Facebook group. The link to our Facebook group is in the show notes. And be sure you don't miss our upcoming episodes. Next week, we are tackling The Meg. We've got another exciting guest for that one. And then throughout the rest of the month, you can expect Get Out and then Event Horizon. It's getting scary. Yeah. So be sure to click subscribe on your preferred podcast provider. Absolutely. Thanks for listening in. The Story Geeks podcast is produced by the Reclamation Society. Let's dig deeper into a quiet place. Right off the bat, the first thing we want to do is introduce you to our special guest today. We have Markeia McCarty from Marvel Movie News and a whole host of other great places. So Markeia, welcome to the show. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for having me, uh, Daryl and Jay, uh, on the Story Geeks. I'm happy to be a part of your new, the beginning of your new horror series. Is that it? Yes, this is the first episode Ooh, yeah. of Scary Movie Month. So Ooh, excellent. we're excited to dive into it with you. Um, just real quick, let everybody know like what you're up to, where they can find you, and all that good stuff. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, like Daryl said, for Marvel Movie News, that's my you know, Marvel nerdery. <laughs> uh, if you want to check that out, uh, that's some popcorn talk, uh, 2 p.m. Uh, that's live shows at 2 p.m. PT. I'm in California. Sorry, everybody. And as far as other places that you can get a hold of me, um, Twitter and Instagram at Markeia McCarty. Uh, there's a K and a silent E in there. Good luck finding it. And for <laughs> <laughs> other things that I do, you can see me on Nerdist, Collider, uh, Geek and Sundry. I'm just, I love to keep busy. Um, Twitter and Instagram is the best place to get a hold of me. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you again for joining us today. And we are going to jump into this. So um, got a whole bunch of questions for you guys. So we'll just kind of get started right off the bat. First of all, I just kind of want to know overall, how did you guys like A Quiet Place? I've been very vocal about how much I love it, but I'm curious, how did you guys think? And also specifically, what makes it a scary movie to you? So Marquia, let's start with you on this one. Uh, I loved A Quiet Place. I mean, um, it and why I loved it and why it's a scary movie for me, for, well, just scary movies and um, horror in general, is that when it gets uh, that vulnerable place, or inside of us, which like um, Get Out, for instance, gets that vulnerable place. It comes from a racial and societal place. With this, with um, A Quiet Place, what it does is it kind of gets you in the same way that uh, Freddy Cougar movies could get you like way back when, because no matter <laughs> what, no matter what, you have to sleep. And then when you sleep, he comes. No matter how quiet we try to be, you will make noise. It yeah. will happen. And then to have these beings that there is no reasoning with them. There is very little chance that you can trick them in any way. And they are always there. That yeah. is terrifying and awesome. It really is. And in fact, Jay, before I go on to you, this is a good point to bring in our Patreon answer to this question. Oh, yeah. Um, as you guys know, on our Patreon account, if you're at the $5, $5 a month yeah. tier, you can actually answer questions about our shows and we will read them on the air. So the one that we have to read today, um, our patron, Jim Baldwin, his answer is really similar to yours, Marquia. He says, I think it's just the constant stress of knowing that the slightest sound could end your life, <laughs> <laughs> which yeah. is terrifying. It's very <laughs> terrifying. Absolutely. Yeah. So thanks for that answer, Jim. Jay, what do you think? I think that fear is built around a threat. So first of all, Marquia's answer was fantastic. Um, and mine's going to be very similar, <laughs> as we will be to Jim's. <laughs> but fear is built around threat to our comfort, uh, which I know is is a very broad way of defining fear. But th that to me is like the way I could, as I was parsing this down, it was just a threat to our comfort in general. We fear things that cause physical, emotional, or even spiritual harm. So whether that's to us, our family and friends, or even to human beings at large, that 
that threat to our comfort seems to be the biggest thing. The impetus for fear in a quiet place is the threat of losing your family members, mm -hmm. which is a big deal. The anxiety of bringing a child into a chaotic world. This is just heightened to the, to the max, right? Um, but then also experiencing the world around us with a disability is a part of the fear that's, that's placed on this movie as well. All of those threats are real to us or most of us. Um, but I think a lot of times, you know, on a daily basis, I don't get up. I, I do have, I do experience anxiety from time to time, but I don't wake up thinking like I might die today. Yeah. Like it, does, it doesn't occur to us to do that. But when we see a movie like this, it reminds us of our humanity and the reality that we are going to die someday or we are going to be uh, uncomfortable in some way, shape or form. Yeah. And how are we going to deal with that? So when it, when you ratchet it up to a scenario where aliens prey on sound, um, that forces our fears to the forefront in that, in that regard. Totally. Yeah. And I remember seeing the trailer for this and this is one of those movies. I, I pride myself on being a movie geek and following like what's being made and stuff like that. I didn't know this was being made <laughs> until I saw the first trailer for it. And I was like, Oh my God, that looks amazing. And at first it was the sound thing. Like that idea sounds terrifying, but seeing more trailers for it. And then especially after seeing the movie, uh, for me, it's much more about the family threat, the idea of your ability to protect your children. I'm a parent. So the ability to protect your children being so severely threatened by your environment. Yes. I already feel that way to some degree. And I live in the suburbs, you know, there's, <laughs> there's no danger surrounding me really. Right. But I fear that my boys could run out into the street and get hit by a car, or right. I fear that a stranger could walk away with them. I right. mean, all these things. So to have that heightened to the degree where you can't even make a sound and you might lose a child, that is absolutely terrifying to me. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And then there's yeah. this, this whole other thing, like, um, yeah, we, we meet them on, what was it? day 98 or 78 is like when yeah. or 82. Yeah, um, like so, that. I mean, just thinking of that time and, and whether they do another uh, sequel or something with this, they could do a prequel with a whole other family. I wouldn't mind a prequel to, to this, but I would not want it with the same family. In yeah. fact, if you really wanted to, uh, you know, drive it home and twist a knife, the prequel should involve the man in the woods and the woman in the woods, that like in cool. some way. I'm not saying that they're the main part of it, but I'm saying that they should be something like something to give you some emotional center with that. And then maybe you follow them <laughs> into the woods and you see what happened where she's stricken down and he stands there mute over her body. Oh yeah. And it'd be cool to not know that that's who they are until you get yeah. way to that point in the movie. Yeah. yeah. That'd be yeah. interesting. I mean, Sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt your train of thought there. No, no, just for instance, just throwing it out there. <laughs> Totally. Um, okay, well, let me throw this question at you guys. Jay, I'll start with you on this one. But in the midst of the tragedy that surrounds the Abbots, we don't hear names in this movie, but if you look on IMDb, we know that <laughs> these are the Abbots, Lee and Evelyn Abbott and their children, Bo and Reagan. I know Bo is the little boy that gets killed in the beginning, Marcus and then Marcus and yeah. Reagan. Mm -hmm. um, so in the midst of the tra tragedy around them, the Abbots have worked hard to maintain their family unit and some sense of a real life, especially Evelyn, right? Like she wants the kids to mm. thrive. Yeah. Um, they've got family dinner. They've got board games. They've got chores. And that's really, really different from a lot of other post-apocalyptic stuff that we see. We see The Walking Dead, and The Walking Dead is all about how heavily does this existence degrade who you are and chip away at your personality. Yeah. Um, this movie would seem to say that you don't have to lose yourself to survive the apocalypse. So I'm curious, do you think you have to lose yourself to survive the apocalypse? It's a good, it's a really good question. A lot of people are tackling this question right now. There's a lot of survivalist kind of shows out there, but I think the real question that's behind this question about losing ourselves to survive the apocalypse is what's more important, our survival or our character? Yeah. Like you have to, you have to make that decision before you are going to make a lot of decisions about your survival. Mm -hmm. Um, I was, I was listening to a podcast the other day and they were talking about how if they had to, they would probably 
they would probably be cannibals. I was like, whoa, <laughs> okay. What? That's, Too far. That's one way to take wow. that. There's, uh, there's a gray that. area in there, yeah. you know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Zero to cannibal. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought that was just so fascinating because it is at the heart of that question. Like, is survival more important or is your character more important? So The Walking Dead is built on that premise. And oftentimes I think it essentially comes to the conclusion that survival is more important than character. Yeah. If you watch that show enough, that's kind of like, in fact, I kind of stopped watching it because I got tired of that. Well, that's <laughs> the ping pong <laughs> effect of Rick, right? Like, yes, exactly. Half the time he thinks it's about survival, half the time he thinks it's about thriving. And, yep, yep. And it yeah. keeps going back and forth. Yeah. I think yeah. A Quiet Place proposes the opposite that, in fact, uh, in A Quiet Place, it is the counterpoint to the premise of The Walking Dead. Mm hmm. Um, Rick Grimes teaches his followers to survive and to survive at just about any cost, whereas Lee and Evelyn teach their kids to experience life amidst their tragic existence. So there's a scene where um, Lee takes his son to the waterfall, and in that scene, I think Lee is teaching his son to release his fear and have a new experience. I think it's more likely that Rick Grimes would teach Carl how to use a bazooka. <laughs> right like <laughs> that seems to be more in alignment with what the walking dead's after um so i do think that we need to decide before it ever occurs what matters more does survival matter more or does our character matter more because those two are going to come at to odds those are going to yeah. be placed at odds at some point in time and would we be willing to sacrifice our character to survive um and i think it would be important for us if we were going to face that kind of scenario to have an answer beforehand because in the desperation of the situation, I think it's easy to lose your character in order to survive. Um, and we'll talk about this more because of the because of the ending of the film. There are some really important things that happen here. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think that uh, character, in my perspective, is superior than survival is. So I'm going to always lean towards the more of a quiet place interpretation rather than the Walking Dead interpretation. Yeah. And really quick, speaking of the ending of this film, I, I, I don't know that we still have to do this on our show, but spoiler alert, yeah. <laughs> we're going to spoil the heck out of this movie. Yes. So if yes. you haven't seen it, go watch it now and then come back and talk to us. Yeah. So Marquia, what do you think about the survival aspect here? Uh, well, I'm going to have to say, in a way, I'm the exact opposite of what... Okay. Uh, um, was that Jay talking? Yeah, that's yes. me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm going to have to say I'm the exact opposite of what he put out there. Because I, I'm of the mind that when it comes to the apocalypse, if it comes during our lifetimes or whatnot, I think it's not so much of us losing ourselves, so much of us becoming exactly who we are in the center of our beings. I see it more... Mm of a cutting away of the fat, you know, it's a leaning of things um, than it is a losing. I think that if you are, and, and I guess a really good example of that would be Carol from The Walking Dead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where who she is at the very beginning, where she is a victim of domestic violence and assault and um, just kind of terrified of the world in general and then the world itself, you know, goes to heck. Uh, and then as The Walking Dead progresses, she becomes Carol. She was like Carol 1.0, and now she's like on Carol 4.0 by now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, I see it more like that is what will end up happening. You know, when the purge meets Fear the Walking Dead happens, <laughs> if it happens, <laughs> I think that who we are inside without you know, the things that society tells us uh, um, for, you know, good or ill, what society drums into us um, as we, you know, grow, as we mature. I think all of that gets stripped away and we become who we are, whether that is a, um, a you know, I'm using quotations here, a good person or a bad person, I think really does depend on the circumstances. But yeah, I see it of a leaning of ourselves. I like that. That makes a lot of sense. I think um, as I think about this, the key component here is hope. I think um, it's interesting to me. I sometimes going back and forth in the movie, I think do Lee and Evelyn really have as much hope 
as they put out there in the movie or are they acting like they do in order to inspire mm-hmm. that within their kids? Yeah. And I mean, it goes back and forth, I think, but well, that's what I love. Well, she does say, I'm sorry to interrupt. No, go ahead. She, she does say, if we can't save them, then who are we? Exactly. Yeah. So it's like their existence. I almost wonder if they didn't have kids, would they have survived? If they didn't have someone to fend for, you know, if that wasn't their core self, maybe that's also another reason why they decided to bring a baby into the world because their core selves is they, they have to be doing for somebody else. Totally. It gives you something bigger to fight for. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. And I, that's one of the things I love so much about this movie versus other apocalyptic things is the striving for hope no matter how grim things are right, right. no matter how few people there are left in the world or because they don't know they're in this little rural area and yes there's some other people lighting fires that lee can see out there right so we know there's at mm-hmm. least a few other people out there but they don't know how far sweeping this is they don't know if the world is over they don't know if it's just their little town true and just the maintenance of hope in the, in the midst of that I love. And I love the little pictures they give it. Like, I love how they've adapted the Monopoly board to be quieter and, <laughs> and dinner on the leaves and stuff like that. So Yeah, and they found sand somewhere, a lot of sand. A lot of sand. A lot, <laughs> a of, sand. lot of sandbags, a lot yeah. of them, especially for an area that doesn't necessarily look like it floods a lot. But yeah. I don't know, whatever. <laughs> True, true. Where did all that sand come from? Mm-hmm. Um, I actually well, looked one... for sandbags, and I was like, oh, this is kind of harder to find. I, I probably yeah. just didn't go to Lowe's like I should have. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so the next question here. There's a scene in the movie, and this is a small scene, but we on the Story Geeks like to latch onto these small scenes and <laughs> dig into what they might mean. So there's a moment in the movie where the, the abbots take a minute to pray before they eat, or at least what certainly looks like praying. I was talking to my wife about it, and it could be like a moment of silence for Bo. There could be some other things surrounding it, but it really looks like a family prayer before eating dinner. Mm -hmm. So it's really quick, but I'm curious what you guys think about that, what you think it says about the existence of spirituality in the world of this movie. So, Marquia, you want to start us off on that one? Uh, Sure. I mean, I... I kind of see it as a little column A, little column B with that, because we were, we see them one day, and I forget the day, sorry, 82, we'll say 82 for right now, and I'm sure um, your beginning. listeners can, yes, at the beginning, <laughs> yeah. and then it's, uh, was it, uh, and then it's exactly a year later, or something like I wanna that. I want to say it's like 471 or something like that. Yeah, like 472, I want to yeah. say. Yeah. I want to say 472, but I'm sure that they can good correct us. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, yes, I I feel like because of um, the way the kids, you know, automatically go to grab hands, this is something that doesn't just happen on special occasions or just on the year of Bo's death, that mm-hmm. this is something that, yeah, this is, this is tradition. You know, this is part of, um, you know, the dinner ritual. Uh, I don't know for, I don't know what religion that the abbots are. I mean, we can make speculation on it. Yeah. For all I know, they're, you know, um, universalists, you know. Um, but, yeah, I I honestly, I personally, just speaking for my own, my own self, I don't see how if aliens have come to our planet and we've somehow managed to survive that I wouldn't give thanks to some energy out there (laughs) are are just are just gratitude of we're eating together we have this together we've survived we've survived another day and please god no night terrors kind of a thing yeah right seriously yeah nothing that makes you wake up screaming (laughs) yeah Yeah. like me watching event horizon (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah i think i think it connects back to the previous question about like what do we have to lose or what do we have to and actually i, I like marquee i like your your leaning of the character right like our 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 true selves will come out uh whether or not we like that true self or not is going to depend upon a lot of different factors maybe but i think spirituality in general is 
for the most part, um, I'm going to make a big generalization here. So this is not true. I'm sure not true all around, but spirituality in general, especially in our Western context is generally focused around character. Mm -hmm. It's generally focused around like, um, what you putting, putting yourself at the center of your spirituality and saying like, what am, what am I concerned with, with my character? What makes me, me, what makes God, God, what makes, uh, you know, energy, energy, what makes any, take any kind of religion that you, you find out there. Um, so both the individual character and the collective values and beliefs of a society that's kind of all wrapped up in this kind of spirituality um, that you could see out there. In a quiet place, the Abbott family has a very intentional way of living in order to preserve their character and their values. Yeah. Um, and there's, I think there's a, there's a place for hope within that environment, a hope for something bigger than just survival. And I think Marquis is pointing to it like, if you had that hope, you would be very grateful. Yeah. To whatever it was, he would be very, very grateful in that hope. Um, and I think A Quiet Place also shows us what it's like to lose hope because we see that happen with the old man mm -hmm. and his wife. So suddenly his own survival no longer matters. He's lost all hope. He's like, why, why does it matter for me to live anymore? Yeah, um, not only that, he doesn't care about any of the other survivors around him. That's exactly right. what I was going to say. Yeah, he, he does not care about other people either. He just only cares about what happens to him in that moment. He's lost all hope. He just wants to die. And he lets his own despair put Lee and Marcus in danger. Yeah. He lets that happen. Um, so, so the old guy puts all the focus on himself. Uh, and in that moment, his tragedy endangers Lee and Marcus. The opposite is true. This is what I love about this film. And I actually struggled with this moment. I'll talk a little bit more about that later in some of your other questions. But the opposite happens when Lee takes the same, takes a similar role. He goes, I can actually save people and become others focused. I can actually have my kids be saved if I do the same action that the guy did. The guy did it out of despair. I'm going to do it out of a hope for a future for those kids, for my kids. It feels like we're dancing around the issue. Lee dies. Yeah. We can just go ahead and say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Get it out of the he way. Screams, right he screams <laughs> to attract the aliens and he dies. So, and I think that that's, that's the same sort of other focused, as Marquia says, gratefulness that you would experience in a family who says, we're going to take time to express gratitude or to pray. They're going to be others. They're going to be more others focused in general. Yeah. Whether it's, even if it's, even if it's not like a Western Judeo Christian religion there, that's, that's an activity that is probably focused on not putting themselves at the height. Like you, it would feel very awkward for Rick Grimes as we talk about the walking dead. It'd feel very awkward for him to do that because he's constantly putting himself and his little group of followers above other people and being yeah. like, well, they got to die for us to survive. Let's just do it. Yeah. So it's a different mm -hmm. environment. I think it works. I think it works really well in a quiet place. The way that they've kind of captured that. When I think about that scene with the old man, something that I would love to ask John Krasinski yeah. is, did they know him? Did the Abbots know that old couple? Oh yeah. Because it didn't seem like Lee and Marcus were that far away. It seems like Lee's been to that waterfall many times before well, they didn't spend the night anywhere right yeah exactly yeah. No. so it's close it's not like they were way out in uncharted territory per right. se so it seems likely to me that they knew him yes or they had at least met them before true i was always curious about that not it doesn't really matter but <laughs> <laughs> um but getting back to the question uh i like what you guys said about gratitude and feeling the gratitude towards an energy or god or whatever it is that you put your hope in and even taking it a step farther than that, it seems like in such a desperate situation, you would want that in order to continue to inspire hope. So sure. not only would you be grateful, but prayers around the dinner table would be like, please help us to have this again tomorrow night. <laughs> you know, yeah, like yeah, yeah. <laughs> you'd be placing your hope in that for even protection beyond what you can see around you, which is so frightening. Well, the movie doesn't, it, it, you know, when, when Bo dies... I know that Lee still has more to live for because he still has more family members. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And obviously Evelyn then becomes pre pregnant. And the, we don't know, but it, we, we would assume that the older gentleman has no other family members. Yeah. But I think their, their response, the movie treats grief in a very real way. Yeah. We see how it's impacted them a year later. They're still mourning the loss of their son. 
But I think what you see in the Abbott family is you see a hope for something more than just the next day being okay. Right. Because the next day is not always okay. The next day sometimes sucks because you lose your son because he turns on a, a toy that yeah. he should be able to play with in a normal world. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that there's there's more hope in, in that than there is in what we see from the, the older gentleman. So. And just from a parental perspective, I'm so glad they addressed that because being a dad of young kids, yeah. There are no toys that kids love more than the ones that make noise. <laughs> so I'm glad they put that in and there. And no toys that parents hate more, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, sometimes. It's true. Mm-hmm. Um, let's take a look at some of the representations of love in this movie. So I'm just gonna, we're going to go through a few different relationships here, and I'm just curious how you guys feel about what these relationships look like, what this kind of love looks like. So let's start with Lee's love for his kids. So, Jay, why don't you start us on this one? I almost want you to tackle this before before I tackle it because I feel like you, <laughs> you I have kids. You, well, you have kids, and you also I, I can tell by the crafting of the question that you have some really intense thoughts about it. So why don't you go first? Well, Break I mean, the rules. Okay, so I mean, you see two different approaches of love for your kids yeah. in Lee and Evelyn. I think th- I had heard an interview with Krasinski, and I think the way he puts it is Lee wants his kids to survive, mm. and Evelyn wants them to thrive. So she's definitely the more nurturer, and he's more like, let me teach you what you need to know in order to survive without me, you know? Um, But I love talking specifically about Lee. One of my favorite elements of this movie is his relationship with Marcus and his relationship with Reagan. And I think those are developed so beautifully. I mean, with Reagan, it's a big part of how they win in the end, right? Mm -hmm. He's been developing all of these hearing aids and desperately trying to help her to be able to hear again. Right. And she didn't even realize it per se. Like her relationship with him is really strained because she feels like he doesn't love her. Right. But he loves her unbelievably deeply. And then you referenced the scene at the waterfall with Lee and Marcus, which I think might be my favorite scene in the movie. Mm. Cause I can just picture me sitting at a waterfall trying to reassure my son, you yeah, know? Yeah. And, um, well, and giving a kid the freedom to scream. Yes. Is so cool. Yeah. And mm-hmm. on a small level, like, like my version of that is taking my son to a park and finally letting him go nuts. Yeah. Totally. You know, let him run, let him be himself. And we spend so much time protecting them and holding them back from stuff for what we believe to be their own good. Right. A lot of times it is. A lot of times it's our own insecurities, whatever. But um, just to see that moment where he lets his son feel free to express himself and he's there with him and it's okay. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. So, I mean, that's th- th- that's the element of the movie that I definitely relate to the most because I'm a dad. Yeah, so totally. So seeing this representation of a dad, obviously I'm going to latch onto that <laughs> in a big way. But Absolutely. What about you guys? Was there anything that stood out to you between Lee and the kids? Uh, sure. A number, a number of things. Um, I wish that Lee, for whatever reason uh, in this movie, um, I wish that he had felt more, I guess, free with showing his kids how much he loved him, uh, mm-hmm. how, how much he loved them. Like, is it that big of a deal to take Reagan down to see the hearing aids and what he's been doing on and uh, what he's been working on? Because there's, it's, there's a, um, and I, and, and I know we're talking about a quiet place. So oh goodness, but um, there's a lack of communication, <laughs> really. There's a huge mm. lack of communication that Lee has um, with his children. And then that's where a lot of my frustration viewing uh, the movie came from where it's like, mm. I understand that you, it's best not to talk. So you sign, uh, Reagan understands sign. If, if he doesn't understand enough sign language, Reagan can obviously read. So to then you communicate with your kids. I mean, yeah. why, why is it so difficult to just let Reagan know, Hey, I feel like you've already got this on lockdown going to and from the waterfall. I feel like you are a survivor already. I need for you to protect your mom while I go teach Marcus how to get to your same level of survival. It's like, yeah. how difficult is that to just be open with your kids, especially with this time that they're in where it's like everything's a terror. The world is a terrifying place. Sound, making a sound is an enemy. 
that's that's huge to to pile stuff on top of that. Uh, I mean, I, I don't doubt that he doesn't love his kids, but that was extremely frustrating for me to see that. But of course, they're human, and you know, us humans have <laughs> have faults. <laughs> so it's just um, as like uh, all of that was completely unnecessary if there had just been more communication. And I felt that Evelyn was actually doing a really good job communicating um, with the with the kids um, for. For what we saw, the, I felt like there wasn't a lot of Evelyn in the film until like until we got near the end. Mm. Um, she seemed more like um, I don't know. It, it was uh, I wasn't as invested in Evelyn's character as I was in say Reagan's or Lee's. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, I, I agree with all of what you guys have said. So there's nothing to contradict that. Although I did. To showcase the, the how well this is written, um, my my mom and dad actually fit the exact opposite. The, if you were gonna say that there was uh, male female gender st stereotyping here, like you'd have the male who's kind of more brooding and de doesn't deal with loss as well and isn't as good as showing love to his kids, and then you'd take the females like more the more nurturing one, right? So they they kind of they're kind of using general stereotypical 1950s relationships my mom and dad were the opposite of that so in real life my mom was way more like lee and my dad was way more like evelyn and as you talked about that Marquea, i could not help but think about my mom passed away in 2012 and i could not help think about like yeah my mom was actually operated a lot like lee and when mm -hmm. i when i was grieving going through the grieving process one of the things i realized was that she was so bad at expressing her feelings towards those around her. What I recognize is that um, I do that a lot myself, and it's a lot of times because we look at tasks the same way we would look at emotions, and they're not the same thing. They're totally different. And to be able to emote with people as opposed to just drive to the next task um, is very different. So, so Reagan can't understand that her dad loves her until she sees how hard he's been working on her behalf. Yeah. All she really needed was him to sit down and, and like you're saying, Marquia, say, look, I love you. It's, it's not your fault that Bo died and I love you beyond anything else. Like, so, but, but he can't, he can't quite get there. Yeah. And I, and I think it is frustrating. And if you've experienced it in real life, it, it can actually be fairly uh, tragic as well, because you, you have to carry with you this thought that like things were left unsaid that I would rather have said. Yeah. So, and she's probably going to feel that way based on what happens in this film. <laughs> yeah. So that's true. I, I think as far as how communicative Lee could have been with her, I mean, the surfacey answer to that, and I don't think it's sufficient, is that that workshop is where he also has everything posted about how much he knows about the aliens and stuff, right? Right, right, right. right. So maybe there's yeah. information down there he doesn't want her having. He wants but to shelter why? her from that. Why wouldn't he? That's the thing. All of them are in it together. Ah, this is one of those frustrating things <laughs> yeah. uh, for me because it's like, you know, I, I can understand not bringing Marcus um, down to the basement because he, from what you can see of his character, might have night terrors and be screaming, yeah. you know, from seeing that. But Reagan, she was like a little rock. But I'm sorry. Please, Daryl, continue. <laughs> no, no. I, I just, I think that's a surfacey answer to that question. I don't think it yeah. covers it. Um, I do think that there is, um, some truth to the idea of him not doing everything right. I mean, as a parent, I don't do everything <laughs> right. Yeah. And I struggle with what do I express to my kids? What do I not express to my kids? And, um, I could l sit here and list out a whole bunch of instances when I feel like I made the wrong choice and it would yeah. have been way better to do something different. So I agree with you that it is frustrating. And I think maybe that's how they wanted you to feel about it. I don't know. I think so because I think that in his death, it's trying to showcase that he's a task oriented person. And that's the way that he shows love at this point in his life. Yeah. And it's like the last way for me to do that is this way. Yeah. Um, so I think they're intentionally showing it, but I agree with Marquia that it's so it's frustrating and tragic because you want him to emote with those kids. You want yeah. him to embrace them. And, and, and especially because he does that with the son, but he never gets there with 
Reagan. And I think he's just trying to protect her for some reason. Mm -hmm. But it does feel uh, we have one of our one of our patrons, Mary, it, it just said, like, I, I thought it was pretty sexist that he only took his Marcus <laughs> and didn't take Reagan. And I, and I kind of agree. It's like, well, that's not I mean, now, granted, I know you can't treat every single one of your kids equally. But in this case, is it the male female dynamic that's happening that he's taking his son and not taking her? I don't or is think it so. because of or is I, it because she has hearing loss? I think it's because yeah. their relation I mean the hearing loss, but yeah. I also think I also think it's because their relationship is strained. Ah. I think he's afraid I, that she won't listen to him when it counts. Oh. I'm I'm giving Lee the benefit of the doubt and and feeling like he knew that Reagan was at a certain level of survivor and Marcus was nowhere near that. So that's why he oh, was yeah. taking Marcus out, you know you know, to, to get his feet wet, so to speak, ha <laughs> pun <Yeah>. intended. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then maybe the next trip, if they had had, it might've been all three of them together uh, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. I will, uh, we'll move on to another dynamic here, but the last thing I want to say, I keep referencing all these podcasts and special features and stuff like that. Cause I love this movie to death and I've explored every Avenue of it that I can because yeah. of how much I love it. And I've heard John Krasinski talk on a podcast about when he was engaging with Millicent Simmons and um, Noah Jupe, who plays Marcus, and how to get to know them. And in order to get to know them, he invited them and their families over to his house. Yeah. And they had like a barbecue and a get together. And the idea was that he could watch them be kids with their parents and uh, they could watch him be a dad with his parents and yeah. kind of get to know each other that way. Yeah. And at one point, he walked over to Millicent, who is deaf in real life, and um, asked her, how do you sign I love you? And there's a few different ways to do it. So she taught him. And then she said, well, how do you say I have always loved you? And she showed him with like that winding motion and stuff that you see in the movie. Yeah. And he says he started to tear up. And he was like, that's going in the movie. Uh, <laughs> like, that's, that's awesome. right, right yeah. there is when that was. Before we continue, I just want to let you know a little bit about all of the additional content over at thestorygeeks.com. On our website, you can find our latest YouTube videos, Patreon posts, and additional written content from our blogger, Ashley Pauls, who shares her own thoughts on all of our podcast questions over at thestorygeeks.com. Be sure to check out our podcast with Helen O'Hara from The Empire Podcast, one of our most popular shows. Also, be sure and check out, we did recently a show on making the Justice League better. And you should definitely check that out, out as well, because that's a movie that definitely needs to be made better. <laughs> so we tried to do that. Or just remade altogether. <laughs> so for all of that, plus Ashley's killer blog posts, you can go over to thestorygeeks.com and check all of it out there. And we would love for you guys to support us. First of all, there's Patreon. You can support us monthly through our Patreon page. If you're not familiar with Patreon, it's a website that allows fans to support creators if you love what they do. So you can support us for as little as $2 a month. There's different tiers and you get different content for each of those. If you love what we do, we would really appreciate it if you became a patron. So please consider that. Like we said, as little as $2 a month, you can head on over to patreon.com slash the story geeks to find out more about that. Um, secondly, we have merch. You can see Jay's rocking the Story Geeks shirt over here. That's one of several shirts that we have. And we have the Story Geeks mug here. Head on over to our merch store and check that out. And then lastly, we have a sponsor that we love dearly. It's Modern Mouse Boutique. So if you love to get dressed up and look dapper and stuff like that when you go to these theme parks, this is your best way to do it. If you're looking on YouTube, you can see Jay's holding these up. Modern Mouse Boutique sells geek fashion accessories and they're famous for having some of the highest quality mouse ears that you can buy. So if you're planning a trip to a theme park or if you're just a geek and you love this stuff in general, check out ModernMouseBoutique.com. Use promo code STORYGEEKS. No the, just STORYGEEKS. That's all one word. Use that and you'll get 10% off your next order at ModernMouseBoutique.com. Links to all of this stuff, our Patreon page, our merch store, Modern Mouse Boutique, everything you'd ever need can all be found in the show notes or on our blog at TheStoryGeeks.com. So thanks for letting us interrupt. Let's dive back into A Quiet Place. We talked a little bit about Evelyn already. Was there any other angles that you guys wanted to throw out about Evelyn's relationship with the kids? Well, um, mm. there I don't feel like it was investigated a lot. Well, not investigated. Um, highlighted a great deal with this movie. It seemed it happened more 
in the background or maybe Mm -hmm. it was left up to the audience to then fill in, you know, those gaps with their own experience with it. Or maybe it was just like assumed. Um, Yeah. I, well, well, like what I said earlier, I just wasn't as invested in uh, Evelyn's character. So, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I didn't doubt her love for the kids, but I wonder if that was more of what I assume would be there than what I actually saw. But then that's my experience. You certainly had the vibe that it's almost like they had a conversation at one point and decided that once the baby comes, it's like Evelyn focus on the baby and mm-hmm. Lee focus on the other kids. You know, yeah. you almost get and that you know teach them. She was teaching them, so there right. was. Um, I believe it was Marcus that uh, that she had the board set up and everything. They were, uh-huh. uh huh, yeah, homeschooling them. So yep. I mean, there were there was evidence there that uh, there was a lot being put in by Evelyn. Hmm. Yeah, I think one of the biggest moments about her that you get to see. You know, you talked earlier, Marquia, about the who are we if we can't protect them line. Mm-hmm. And there's another line in there where she starts to talk about Bo. And she's like, I could have carried him. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. My arms were free. I could have carried him. And she starts to, to feel that regret and that guilt and stuff Survivor's like that. Survivor's guilt. Yeah. yeah. When you wake up after giving birth to a baby in a flooded basement and you look across the room and there's one of the alien creatures near your baby and then it slides into the water and you keep on moving forward to get your baby, that that was uh, that was love. There you go. That was <laughs> that was that was a love that um, all of us hope someone loves us that much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for real. <laughs> no kidding. In the way that, in the way that, like, it's just so visceral when she steps on the nail, oh. and you're just sitting there and you're like, "How do you not scream at the top of your lungs when you step on that nail?" But she knows she can't. Beyond that, how do you not scream at the top of the lungs while giving birth? Oh, mm. both and right. I mean, like, she had that one instance with the fireworks, but that didn't last very long. Yeah, the, the rest of the birth. Exactly, <laughs> you know? it's insane. So, so yeah. Yeah. Yeah, crazy. that's she's actually a superhero. I mean, has to be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. What about uh, Lee and Evelyn's love for each other? Do you guys have anything specific that stood out to you about that? What about you, Jay? Uh, you know, I really enjoyed the gentleness they had for one another. There, there, there could have been a lot of uh, blaming one another for for the different aspects of Bo's death, mm-hmm. right? Um, but they had this gentleness for one another that I think that Lee, even though he's struggling with with Reagan and he and he's actually able to to kind of get there with Marcus, he also gets there with Evelyn. Like yeah. you see that he cares deeply about her um, as his wife. I think the most interesting thing to me is that I don't know if I've seen a movie where it's the relationship seemed so authentic, and obviously it's because it, it is yeah. <laughs> right. Like <laughs> they, they um, are married. <laughs> yeah. This is not two actors pretending to love one another. Yeah. Like, this is actually a husband and wife on screen, and they really do seem like they love each other dearly. So yeah. that gave the movie a whole sense of uh, groundedness. And as you talk about, you know, um, as you talk about John inviting these families over to his house, that all creates this genuine feeling of, like, well, mm-hmm. I care about these people. These people are actually really mean something to me. Um, which is really fascinating. I also got the sense, and I can't really point to why I feel this way. So this is not from the story itself. Maybe I'm putting these on the on the story, but I got the ins- the sense that they both possessed two things that I feel like are really essential to a marriage, and it's that they were focused more on one another's needs than they were on their own, mm-hmm. despite the fact that they're still trying to survive. Yeah, and they both have very important tasks to do they had a sense that they cared about the other person deeply and those that person's needs at that time. Um, even when you see on the look on John's face when he knows that she's about to give birth because the lights go red, yeah. but he knows he can't be there because he, he legit can't do it. Yeah. It's like this devastation that like I can't do it even though I would rather... He would yell at that point in time if it would help, right? Yeah. Like he would do it. And the second, the second thing was the ability to forgive each other for their mistakes. Mm. There's no, they're not holding. You see this a lot, a lot of times in 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 uh, 
marriage fights where it's like, well, no, it's your fault that they did this. And no, you, you, you've you lived with too much guilt and yeah, you've you know, moved away from the family. There's a sense that they know that they both could have done more, but maybe they have to forgive each other yeah. for what has occurred. And I thought that was really, really cool. What do you think, Marquia? Uh, I really enjoyed the scene in the basement when they were uh, slow dancing together. I'd like to think mm. that that was their song, you know, um, while uh, that was cool. happening. Yeah. That I mean, speculation, complete speculation. But in my <laughs> in my movie in my mind movie, uh, it's their song. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, and then uh, the moment that they have uh, in the basement, where between the two of them, where she's saying, um, "If we can't save them, then you know, what are we?" Kind of thing and then his vow to her that yeah. he would find them um i i feel like and this is this might be me just laying it on there but i feel like even then he was like that subtext was you know or i'll die trying you know, yeah that's that's gonna happen no um, i'm totally with you on that i almost feel like it's i know i am going to die trying like it, it yeah. almost felt that strong to me hmm. yeah because kind of that uh just the look on his face um, when he opened his mouth to draw the alien to him. He, he knew what he was giving up and who all he was giving that up for. And then when they cut to yeah. her, when she saw what was going on and she's like having to be a spectator, of, of a silent spectator for all of this. Wow. Yeah. 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 It's frightening. I think one of the things that really stands out to me about their relationship is when they are communicating to each other, whether it's talking or signing, whatever it is, it's all completely utilitarian. It's mm -hmm. like, do this, do that. This is what we need. It's, they have it down to the bare minimum mm -hmm. of communication. And then when they finally get a quiet moment alone in the basement with each other, I love that they don't talk. They just dance and they just be together mm. i think that's really cool that is super cool. was there anything specific that stood out to you guys about the relationships between marcus and millicent Mar millicent that's the actress's <laughs> name between marcus and reagan specifically the only thing i would say to that is that it felt like reagan was carrying a lot of guilt like yeah. she needed somebody to tell her like hey it's not your fault like like we still love you anything that was your fault you're forgiven for like she needed that yeah and i could and the only sense that i got between uh marcus and reagan was that marcus kind of knew it he kind of knew how his dad felt he knew how his mom felt and he was just trying desperately to communicate that to reagan yeah. but she couldn't feel it even with his, the information that he had for her yeah and so that's that's the real thing is that marcus feels like sort of the the person who's trying to reach out and make peace with everyone like yeah hey, oh, come on like, like yeah. it's all good here uh he so makes a good mediator or he would have made a good yes mediator he does between everybody. yeah exactly exactly and i think he feels kind of the same frustration that you were talking about marquia with couldn't lee have just shown reagan what he was working on yep because he asks lee he's like do you love her like do you still love her and he's like, of course I do. And he's like, you should tell her, yeah, <laughs> you <yeah>, know, yeah. <laughs> That's a pretty smart thing for a little kid to say. Yeah. Because yeah. Uh, with Marcus, he's very upfront <laughs> about his feelings and what's going on and, yeah. and everything. Um, but you you definitely for the relationship between Reagan and Marcus, you definitely see that she it feels like she's taking care of him. I mean, yeah. um, from the scene when she finds the flashlight in the cornfield and then goes to find out what's going on with the flashlight. <laughs> yeah. And when he grabs her, her wrist and then she's immediately, you know, holding on tight uh, with him. And then she's a little bit of a hothead on the top of the silo. And you can see there where Marcus is once again, trying to mediate. So mm, yeah, I, yeah, I see, I see their relationship in that way. Yeah, definitely sure. the big sister, younger brother. Okay. Let's move on to the big question. <laughs> the big question about this movie. Did Lee have to die? And how do you feel about the way that it happened? Okay. Well, my very first viewing of this, I kind of wondered why, with Evelyn being a mute spectator, of that she didn't just, 
you know, make a noise somewhere, um, either in the house or move away from the house to then make some sort of noise to get the creatures away from her family. Uh huh. And then I realize, uh, for one, she has a newborn baby with her, even though um, the baby is quiet then when she makes a noise, there's nothing that says the baby will remain quiet once the aliens are closer to her. Yeah. So thinking of, you know, not necessarily just frozen in shock, but probably also her wheels are spinning in that way. So then I thought, okay, he didn't, ugh. all right. Um, <laughs> long answer short, no, I didn't feel like Lee had to die for this. I play a lot of RPGs, so I tend to think outside the box with like a lot of things. I love that they had the rockets <laughs> for like the noise. He had an axe and he was near like I think that was a metal structure or the thing heard when he dropped the handle and looked at him. He could have just whacked the axe on that metal structure, which would have been like this huge noise. And then like, you know you know, soft toe pity pat backwards on the sand and the alien would have gone running for that metal structure, mm -hmm. giving the kids a chance to get out of the truck and, you know, further away from it. And then they would still have their protector, the dad, either that or like, you know, lock in the, um, what they did and have the truck roll down the hill and he would have stayed up there with the alien, but have been extremely quiet, except for when another loud noise needed to be done. I mean, but then... I wasn't in that, you know, high emotional <laughs> um, <laughs> scenario right then where, you know, I have an opportunity to think things through. I just think it, I think it worked really great for the movie, but I don't think he needed to die. Hmm. Okay. What do you think, Jay? Uh, I'm still not sure. <laughs> it, it, this is, I think Marquia is, is really on to something because as a writer, you have two, you have two jobs, right? You have to you have to connect emotionally with your audience, and then you also simultaneously have to plot it out correctly. And I think they do both really, really well. The thing that was occur that occurred to me as I was watching the film, his death for a second took me out of it mm -hmm. because I went, "Whoa, why, why that? Like that's that's crazy, right?" Um, and then after it was over, and I started to process it. I started to think through the elements of this film and why they were elements in this film. And I came to the point where I started at, oh shit, why did this have to happen? <laughs> Was it necessary? I ended up at the point where I said, I think it gets across the core premise of the film. He still has hope. He's there to protect his kids. It is in alignment with his character to sacrifice himself for his kids. And that callback that we talked about earlier where he saw the guy do that out of despair, but he's using this, the older gentleman, but he's using the same thing to produce hope and to save as opposed to just destroy, as opposed to only destroy. He's doing that, um, for others. And I think that that completes the arc that he has to go along, which is to say he has to figure out his, his final moments. I've always loved you. Now I'm going to shout out and take, and, and so I'm not only going to do the task. I've been doing the tasks. You, you haven't known that I've been doing the tasks behind the scenes because I love you so much. I have not been able to communicate with you. I know that that's frustrating, but in my final moments, I am going to communicate with you and then I'm going to save your life by being a distraction. And, and bring hope to the same hopeless thing that Marcus would have seen with the older gentleman and, and redeem that moment to a, d to a degree. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of started out with saying like, from a plot perspective, it doesn't seem like it has to happen. But from a character arc and an emotional arc, I do believe that it actually does have to happen because ne we need to see that others focused love that the film is saying is at the core of its premise. Yeah. You know what would have really solidified that for me is when he dropped the axe handle, the alien didn't pay him any attention because it had, it knew that prey was there. Um, I would have even liked oh, a little, I would have liked a little, hey, while it's still attacking the truck. And then maybe it like sort of looks up, but that wasn't enough. So mm. then, ah! 
Yeah, there you yeah. go. There you go. That, yeah. That'd be awesome. Yeah. I will say, I, I don't know if it had to happen. I love that it did. Yeah. It's part of what makes me love the movie. Um, so a couple of things about the mechanics of it, first of all, that always come to my mind. Like, yeah, Mar- Marquia, you're right. He could have created a noise elsewhere. He could have thrown something into the woods. There's a whole bunch of other ways he could have made noise that weren't just yelling and attracting it to himself. The two things, and again, I'm not saying that that was the only thing he could have done, but the two things that sort of inform my thinking about that were, one, he was already wounded, and I sort of assume he believes he was mortally wounded. Mm. Like, in a sense, that alien had already killed him. Mm. It just hadn't finished yet. Okay. Um, Mm. Because it got him pretty bad (laughs) before it went (laughs) after the truck. Um, And then the other thing to think about is... You know, we think about him yelling and the alien getting him. We think about the old man yelling and the alien getting him. What we tend to not think about, Marcus yelled to attract the alien. That's why it didn't just kill Lee completely to begin with, because Marcus yelled to get it to go after him. Hmm. So I love the symmetry of Marcus did it two seconds before Lee did it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Now, mechanically, the one thing I'd always question is if the alien could bust through the wall of a grain silo, yeah. uh-huh. why couldn't it get into the truck more quickly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but, I, I, think, uh, I think maybe that was the power of panic. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's true. That's a good yeah, That's a good way to put it. Um, so I love that. And I love, uh, obviously, I love the self-sacrifice. I love what it teaches Reagan and what it teaches the rest of his family. Mm and stuff like that and how it informs the ending of the film which we'll get to but um i think if that were me if i were in a situation where there was an alien about to kill my kids yeah i don't know what else i would think of to do i mean that might be what i would do i don't know that's such a crazy thing to think about (laughs) I, i i don't know but uh just thinking about the the gravity of that and the fear of the danger of my kids being about to die yeah. any second now. I mean, that seems like a pretty lot. That might seems like the first thing that would come to your head. It's like, well, come get me instead. Right. Right. You know? right. Yeah, totally. Do we think they were aliens? Yeah. Uh, John Krasinski has said that they are. Yeah, that they are. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I meant to keep on a, like to pay more attention to like the headlines of it to see if it said they landed or something like that. But yeah, um, I don't know if it says that. I know it says something about them believing that there's three of them or at least three of them. Oh, oh. yeah. Well, um, for in, I was about to say in Krasinski's area in the Abbott's yeah. area. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's like there's, there were at least three there. I don't know. Oh, okay. I'm glad that he said that um, in interviews. Yeah. He's, because I, he said it in I, a bunch I of interviews. Of, I kind of saw it as a escaped government um, kind of project, like something that we would engineer to take mm. out, you know, whoever would be the enemy at the time, something yeah. that would rely on sound. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. they're aliens. Uh, Never mind. Let's continue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're aliens. And he's got, they have a whole huge backstory for it that they intentionally don't show you because they want Ooh. you to feel what the Abbots feel. But, um, and I don't the know that you'll ever... <laughs> yeah, yeah, and the Blu-ray doesn't go that deeply into it, to be honest. Oh, really? It has some special features, but it doesn't go that deeply into the backstory. But John talks about the fact that it exists and mm-hmm. that they developed it very deeply so that there would be this backbone to the story. But yeah, they're aliens. Hmm. Cool. So, I do, Now, do you guys... What, how do you feel about the... I know this is not a question you have on here, yeah. but well, how do you feel about the, the design of the aliens? Because we're getting the same... There's a lot of rehashing of the same alien body types going around. It's like the very Stranger Things kind of focus. Yeah, for me, it didn't mm. stand out to me as all that unique. Uh-huh. Um, I keep talking about special features and stuff, but the more you listen to John Krasinski talk about the journey that they went through and why they thought of some of that stuff, yeah, then you're like... Oh, okay. Really yeah, cool. Yeah. So but, the world building is awesome. Yeah. 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 I mean, um, I'm glad that they weren't completely bipedal, which we like mm. to do with mm-hmm. uh, with our aliens. So they didn't look like the independent state aliens, which seems to be, you know, kind of uh, you run into that a lot. Uh, my favorite yeah. aliens are the actual, well, uh, uh, was it uh, xenomorphs? xenomorphs? I like xenomorphs. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Mm. I mean, those are my favorite. I mean, I thought the yeah. design was good. I, I liked the 
I liked when it opened up his head because that was very nightmarish. Mm -hmm, um, and yeah. then when it, it's like they already listen, but it opens, it blossoms his head open and then turns his ear towards you. <laughs> and all you can yeah. think of is it will hear my heartbeat. So yeah. I did it. I did appreciate that. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I like them. Um, okay, just a couple more quick questions here as we wrap up. Um, Reagan's deafness ends up being a big part of how the aliens are defeated. It's like her disability becomes her superpower, so to say. So um, I'm just curious, did this spark anything in you guys, make you think about anything in terms of representing disabilities in films? Do you think this sets an example for other films to pick up on? Uh, Jay, what do you think on that one? Uh, I don't know. I, I was when I, when I saw this question um well first of all i do appreciate the fact that they actually cast an actor who 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 lives this daily yeah because then it's it's much more real i think now, I, now obviously acting itself isn't necessarily real but in this case i think to pull off this level the sound design of this film is fantastic There's, i mean i can't even think of a better sound design in film than this i mean we talked about uh we talked about this with a friend of ours about the people in the theater when you're seeing the film didn't even want to open their popcorn because yeah. <laughs> it was it was it was <laughs> such a silence was such an important part of the film. Um, it's that's I how I felt. Think, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I, the only thing that I would say, and I, and I don't think that anyone can answer this besides um, uh, people who are experiencing in their own, this in their own life is how much of it feels like a gimmick in a movie about silence to have a character who's deaf or how much of it is a gimmick and how much of it is like, no, 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 this is, this is really cool because I, I can see myself in this character and I can see this character interacting with this world in, in a really powerful way. So I don't even know that I'm qualified to answer the question. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if it's, I don't know how that works. I do. I will say that a powerful part of the plotting is that she she's the one that figures out how to defeat the aliens using her father's work yeah and completing her father's work and then completing that arc um which i think is a really cool kind of plot device mm -hmm. i'm just not sure if that ends up making it more gimmicky so yeah what do you think marquia uh well i i enjoyed that this film took what society loves to label uh, as a disability uh, mm -hmm. because it's uh, something that not everybody has. So therefore, you know, it has to limit that person's experience. Um, so therefore it is a disability. I like that they took that perceived flaw and turned it into a power. Um, I very much enjoyed that with this film because one of the things that um, I feel like we run into a lot is that, you know, that whole big question of why are we here? You know, where do I fit? Where, you know, what's my puzzle piece in this giant puzzle that I can see of the world? And then with um, Reagan, with her frustration over um, the hearing aids, it's like they never work. None of them work. You know, that's something that she says um, in the film. And yeah. just like the general frustration with like communication and then has the aliens thing. And then on top of that, the, um, the guilt of Bo, uh, and then to be able to turn that around and find out that because she is who she is, all the gloriousness that is her, that coupled together with her father's ingenuity, that that becomes the downfall of these murderous aliens. That's excellent. I, I very much enjoy that. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have wanted it to be any other way. I, I feel like, it's a good way, like, you know, um, if you've heard of the term uh, paradigm shifts. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, where it's just, we really do need to stop looking at when someone is born differently than us or, or is portrayed differently from us, that it is in some way that they are flawed or they are lesser than. Um, with that, I enjoy movies and storylines that turn that on its head. Um, because totally. someone is born with autism, that just means that they view the world in a different way. And I would love to see that more as a type of power. And I very much enjoyed that this movie did that with Reagan, mm. for instance. Yeah. Well said. Yeah, I agree. I love, I love that that's how they chose to use it. And I love that it gives 
sort of, and this will feed into the next question, but I love that it, um, it does bring almost this comic booky or superhero y element in where it's like, oh, now there's this power to overcome this evil, you know? And yeah. It, it brings this empowerment to the family that wasn't there earlier in the film, which I think is really cool. Yeah, and so, she takes um, down the Outriders, which is in yeah. my head, that's what I call them. <laughs> that's that's what the closest thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, like Jonathan Hickman's Outriders. Oh, <laughs> um, uh, okay. Uh, you see them in Wakanda. They, they try to take a, an infinity Yeah, board. the ones that try to get through the shield. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, well, that's my last question. Let's talk about the ending of the film a little bit. Um, you know, with, with the whole, the revelation that the hearing aid is what's going to help out, but even just with the abrupt ending of, you know, cocking the shotgun and cutting to black and stuff like that, how do you guys feel about the ending and does it leave you satisfied? So Marquia, why don't you take this one first? Uh, well, to go back to what I was saying with like, um, the honing of character and the leaning of character, I felt like Evelyn definitely went through even more of um what would it be like a parsing down when she cocks that uh, shotgun i feel like that's the real evelyn that i see there yeah. um or evelyn 4.0 <laughs> at that point <laughs> yeah where she's like uh she's in that basement she knows how to take them down she has her reagan marcus and unknown uh unnamed baby so and two of them are coming Evelyn is now Evelyn, full Evelyn. The thing that frustrates me so much about the ending, especially with our, I'm not going to say, uh, we tend to, there's a, a portion of uh, America that very much enjoys guns. So there are mm. a number of guns that are available, everything from handguns to assault rifles that are available. Are you telling me that nobody unloaded a clip into one of these aliens before then. It took a shotgun to the head then and not any time before then. That does not make sense to me. So that <laughs> frustrates me. Like, um, I would have preferred for it to be Reagan had put her hearing aid up to the microphone and then had turned up the volume then and its head exploded. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then, okay, I, I mean, I don't want to take away from Evelyn's moment. That was really badass. <laughs> Love that. Yeah. But I would have preferred for it to be something like its skin was a bit too tough for bullets. Because are you telling me someone didn't get like a grenade and try to go after these things? I don't know. Um, I, I would have preferred well, for the Reagan thing to be the answer at the end. Yeah. I mean, just to kind of to answer that a little bit, not that it's the only answer, but Maybe in the world at large, someone took a grenade to it for sure, but the Abbots don't know that. They don't have mm -hmm. the connection to the outside world to know that. And then That's there's true. the idea that the hearing aid incapacitated the alien long enough for them to get a shot off at it. Yeah. Because usually they're crazy fast. <laughs> and mm -hmm. like, you, by the time you cock the gun, you're dead. I got the impression too that their, I don't know why I got this impression, but their skin was maybe because he tried to when he hit it with an axe or something but this skin is resilient enough that they have to open the, their ear canals mm -hmm. in order for you to that's what was the soft tissue if you yeah. will that the shotgun okay. was blowing up i got that impression i might have been interpreting that in, in with information they didn't actually give me um but uh i i think the ending is satisfying i like cliffhangers so long as they are impactful without being over the top so if we if we had actually seen her face off against the next two it that would have been over the top to me it would have felt like well we we made a real shift in this film and it suddenly became an action film you know yeah um mm. so i'm glad we didn't get that i'm glad we actually got the cliffhanger because it was this is still about family and actually we can't defeat the aliens unless the entire family's involved yeah because reagan's got to sit there and then use that machine and i've got to use the shotgun so bring it on, we're the abbots. Yeah. Um, I like that aspect of it, uh, and I'm glad they didn't continue to showcase like what that, how that played out, because I don't think that would have been as impactful. It's interesting that you that. call it a cliffhanger. <laughs> oh, yeah? I don't think it's a cliffhanger at all. No? I, think, I think it's very, very beautifully resolved. Huh. So, I mean, yes, they don't show you them defeating them. Right. But you get to see that, as far as they understand, there are three of them yeah. near them. Well, right there, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
But for their specific experience as the Abbots, you get to see them kill one and have the means to take out the other two and have the confidence to do it yeah. and mm-hmm. to feel the empowerment that Lee sort of left behind sure, with sure, them sure. to do it. So, I wonder how many of them there were. I mean, I don't, I don't see those particular aliens operating a spaceship. That's why in my head they're outriders. Like they're oh, something yeah. that the true aliens have, you know, mm. dropped on us to clear the planet for whatever they want. So if there was a sequel taking place after this, then it would be like, hey, who's who's really behind these dudes? Yeah. And there actually is yeah. a bit of an answer for that. I believe John Krasinski has also said that they're aliens that came via meteors. Oh. Not through spaceships. So they're not intelligent? Oh, I don't know. Okay. Oh, so it's so, evolution. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think the, the sequel will be called Not That of a Quiet Place, and it's just a family living peacefully next to the waterfall. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, a, almost, that's an interesting question. And you see place. the aliens on the other yeah. side of the stream going, damn it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> aliens are like, we're so confused. There's no yeah. one here. Let's just leave. <laughs> Cool. Well, Marquia, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me, y'all. I, I enjoy the conversation. <laughs> Good. Good. That's what we shoot for. So. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's it for today's show. Special thanks to Marquia McCarty for joining us today. Coming up next week on the Story Geeks podcast, we are going to dig deeper into a brand new movie that we haven't seen yet, The Meg. Giant Sharks, baby. (laughs) Giant Sharks. I love Giant Sharks. Don't forget to subscribe. You don't want to miss out on that or any of the other podcasts we have coming up on Scary Movie Month. That's right. And be sure to connect with us in our Facebook group. So let us know your thoughts on today's show and what else you'd like to see us do in the future. If you enjoyed today's show or any of the Story Geeks podcasts, please share our show with a geek friend or someone who's becoming a geek friend. And links to everything that we've talked about today are in the show notes. So thanks for listening. And as always, question everything in your favorite geek stories. And always seek the truth. <laughs>